My daughter and I, we ran out of gas. All right, sir, please move your car out of the road. Stay where you are. Think about it for a second. Guys! Please. She's got it. Shit! <laughs> Everyone dies. Featured in the 2009 film Carrie, starring Chris Pine, Piper Barabra, and Emily Van Camp, which follows a group of survivors trying to stay alive during a viral apocalypse, the world and the virus is a deadly disease with a terrifying 100% mortality rate. In essence, anyone that comes into contact with it will die. Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we're exploring carriers. Wait. Until they come for us. Until the disease dies off. The disease or the people? It's the same thing, really. Like many films in the genre, the pathogen was based on the real-life Ebola virus, a virulent disease with a mortality rate ranging between 25 and 90 percent that causes hemorrhagic fever and organ failure, followed by death. WEV is essentially Ebola on steroids. With an incubation period of only a few hours, it didn't take long for it to claim most human life on the planet. As with all filoviruses, the life cycle of WEV begins with the virion attaching to specific cell surface receptors, followed by fusion of the viral envelope and cellular membranes. The virions taken up by the cell then travel to acidic endosomes and lysosomes, where the viral envelope glycoprotein is cleaved. This process allows the virus to bind to cellular proteins, enabling it to fuse with internal cellular membranes and release the viral nucleocapsid. The WEV structural glycoprotein is responsible for the virus's ability to bind to and infect targeted cells. Replication of the viral genome results in full-length positive strand antigenomes that are, in turn, transcribed into genome copies of negative strand virus progeny. WEV replicates very efficiently in the cells it begins to attack, including monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, liver cells, fibroblasts and adrenal gland cells, among others. The viral replication triggers high levels of inflammatory chemical signals and leads to the septic state the infected end up in. Following infection, immune cells carry the virus to nearby lymph nodes where further reproduction of the virus takes place. From there, the virus enters the bloodstream and lymphatic system and spreads throughout the body. The infected white blood cells, such as macrophages and lymphocytes, then undergo programmed cell death, leading to an abnormally low concentration of lymphocytes in the blood, contributing to a weakened immune response to WEV. The body is under attack, and WEV is viciously assaulting, replicating within, and sabotaging its defenses simultaneously. <laughs> With the infection taking hold, symptoms begin with fatigue, fever, weakness, decreased appetite, muscular pain, and severe dehydration due to loss of bodily fluids. This is followed by shortness of breath, chest pain, swelling, and the development of a rash. Unfortunately, this is just the beginning, with internal bleeding around the corner, revealing the degradation of internal organs, followed by death. It's not safe. <laughs> That's what you get for living in a condom, man. <laughs> you get... <laughs> The world end of virus is both airborne and bloodborne, making it extremely transmissible. Because of this, people in this world are very cautious. They wear masks, gloves, keep their distance, and most of all, they stay the hell away from carriers of the disease. In fact, there are a few rules outlined in the very beginning of the movie. 1. Avoid the infected at all costs. Their breath is highly contagious. 2. Disinfect anything they've touched in the last 24 hours. 3. The sick are already dead. They can't be saved. You break the rules, you die. You follow them, you live. Maybe. Brian and I, we had a dad too. He's just like yours. Every summer when we were little, he would take us to this place, Turtle Beach. Were there lots of turtles? Yeah, there were thousands of them. The film follows brothers Danny and Brian, Brian's girlfriend Bobby, and Danny's friend Kate, who are riding around in a stolen Mercedes, trying their best to survive in this dystopian world. Their plan is essentially to head to Turtle Beach, a secluded spot the brothers used to visit growing up, where they all hope to start a new life together. What makes you think you're gonna be safe there? It's an old motel. The place has been abandoned for years. Go on scavenging trips and quarantine ourselves every single time we get back. It doesn't take long before they run into an infected. Frank, played by Christopher Maloney, has blocked the road with his suburban. Stranded with his daughter Jody, he begs them for gas, but Brian emphatically says no. Reasoning is priority is to keep the group safe. 
Once he realizes Jody's infected, he drives off without hesitation, in a great example of Rule 1 and 3 in action. But with their non-off-road vehicle breaking down shortly after, they're forced to go back to the family they just ghosted with a bit of gasoline. They then agree to scrub the entire car down with bleach before creating an airtight seal in the back seat to separate Jody and Frank, simultaneously employing Rule 2 while breaking Rule 1. Frank then begs them to drive to a nearby high school where a vaccine is rumored to have been developed, but all they see are empty beds covered in blood. They eventually find a doctor who reveals that the vaccine was only able to stave off infection for a few days before victims eventually succumbed. Everyone else in the ward had died, and the broken doctor has decided to end the suffering of him and those under his care. While all of this is happening, Jody begins choking in the car, and despite the risk, Bobby climbs in the back to resuscitate her, only to be immediately splattered with infected blood. Despite Danny's protest, with Jody's condition worsening, the four end up ditching the family and making their way to a nearby hotel on a golf course. Not realizing she was sick, Brian pulls Bobby in for a kiss and is infected. Adding to the mayhem is the revelation that armed men were using the golf course as a base. You know, I just met you, and I'm already sick of you. Have that effect on people. Brian, cut it out! Jesus! Capturing them at gunpoint, they declare their intention to keep the girls until they find out that Bobby is infected. Afraid of getting the disease, they decide to let the group go, and furious at Bobby's betrayal, Brian, who was already pretty callous, reaches his breaking point and kicks her out of the car. I warned you about the girl. I told you to stay away from her. Why the hell couldn't you have listened to me? She was joking. She couldn't breathe. When they find another pair of survivors, Danny tries to reason with them, but Brian cuts right to the chase and shoots them, getting shot in the leg himself during the struggle. As Danny goes to clean the wound, he realizes his brother is infected, with a rash now spreading on his calves. Knowing that they were no longer safe with Brian, they attempt to steal the car keys and abandon him. Catching on, he explains that they will have to shoot him and pry it out of his dead hands, which Danny does, before the pair burn his infected body. Danny and Kate then eventually make it to Turtle Beach and are left reeling by the journey they'd taken and the decisions they made to survive. I think what makes Carriers interesting is that I think on the surface it's a horror movie, but really what it's about, you know, it's about these four kids running away from this pandemic flu, but what they find is that they can't outrun each other. Despite being filmed back in late 2006, the film was actually shelved by Paramount Vantage until late 2009. Chris Pine got his breakout role in Star Trek, so it seems like the studio was hoping to ride the wave of his success. At the end of the day, we are animals. Animals that are bent on survival. Morality in the face of survival, I thought, was a fascinating conflict to be explored. I when discussing the production, directors Alex and David Pastor explained that they wanted to stay away from the zombie genre and keep the film more about people's worst instincts in a crisis. We just need some gas. Sorry, we don't have any to spare. Good luck. I'm begging you! And much of the horror is not just the virus, but people's reactions to it. Strikingly, most of the runtime takes place almost entirely in daylight, with the directors ditching the overcast dark atmospheres in favor of a bright, sun-baked look that highlighted the pressure they were all under. I really enjoyed having the brother process. I loved watching them interact, and they had very distinct personalities, and uh, especially when they would be arguing over something. Notably, makeup artist Stephen Dupois, who won an Oscar for his special effects work on The Fly, and Todd McIntosh, known for his work on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, were in charge of the makeup effects for The Infected, and did a pretty solid job. Ultimately, Carriers was generally well received by Jabronis, but due to its limited release in the US, it only made 908,000 at the domestic box office. It did much better worldwide, pulling in 5 million, which isn't too bad when you consider the delay and hurdles the movie had, but that was still shy of its $9 million budget, making it a flop. Regardless, it's a dark and mostly gripping post-apocalyptic tale about how far people will go to survive. But with that said, of course, we'd love to hear what you guys thought about the movie, so please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, come join our regular streams on Twitch, and uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niaz here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.